So, so it appears that this is the uh, the uh, AI deepfakes panel. It used to be right 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 right. <laughs> And none of us are actually here. Let's get that joke out of the way. We're all deepfakes. None of us are really here. I don't know. So no one has to make that joke again for at least 15 minutes. Exactly. Are you going to make it in 15 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> If you get the deep breaths. <laughs> <laughs> like Trump. Hang on, look at your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to show you where that one is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Very professional operation. <laughs> oh, are you announcing or are you want me to start? Um, yeah, yeah go, ahead go ahead and start. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so let's, let's get it rolling. Okay. So, so uh, this is a deep based AI panel. Yay! Yay. Hey. My name is CJ Myhill. I'm a uh, lawyer, litigator here in Atlanta. I deal in intellectual property and technology law, and uh, I have been randomly designated the moderator. For today, so I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. Uh, I'm going to have all the panelists just introduce themselves, tell you who they are, and and why they're here, and then we'll get into the real meat of the subject. So, Andrew. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Greenberg. I'm the executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association. One of my roles over the past 30 years has been AI designer, which is nothing like the AI we're going to be talking about today. Completely different type of AI, and I'm not actually on the panel because of that reason. I'm on the panel because uh, I serve on the state's Film, Music, and Digital Entertainment Commission, Advisory Committee on the State on All Things Entertainment, and obviously we've been discussing AI quite a bit and been uh, actively involved with uh, the AI uh, subcommittees that have been involved both on the House and Senate side here in Georgia, which are creating legislation which is considered models pro for good and bad of such legislation around the country. So that's the main thing I'm actually here to uh, to share and talk about. Uh, good evening. My name is Phil Cornell. Uh, I'm a writer, uh, war game designer, uh, and I also was in the Navy for 26 years. One of the places I worked at was a place called the Austin Net Assessment. Many of you probably have never heard of it. Its task was to look out 30 years in the future and try and identify what the future security environment looks like. Uh, back in 2011, we had a whole round of discussions about how we would not be able to trust the inputs that we would receive. Uh, we'd not be able to trust photographs, we would not be able to trust uh, data. We would not be. So uh, it was a serious uh, deep dive issue uh, back in 2011, and actually before that, before we even joined the office, about how and if we can trust electronic uh, material. Uh, I'm Meredith Rose. Uh, I am the uh, Inside the Beltway Beast here. Um, I am a senior policy counsel at a group called Public Knowledge. Uh, we're a consumer advocacy organization that works in D.C. with the federal government. Um, and we work on a broad range of tech issues, everything from net neutrality to copyright policy to privacy to antitrust. Um, and I, as the IP lead, uh, got swallowed up by AI, um, because that is all anybody has wanted to talk about for about the last 18 months. So I had to get real, real good at it real fast. And so we'll also be talking about some of the deep fake issues, uh, in addition to the policies about the legal ramifications with rights of privacy, rights of publicity, and various proposed laws and legislation that might be coming along to, to address some of these things, or, or maybe not. Uh, but one thing I will say is that this, we have plenty to say, this panel could go six panels. There's, there's a lot to cover here, but we want to make sure that you're hearing what you are interested in too. So to the extent you have any questions, we don't need to wait to the end, you know, raise your hand. We can come up with the mic and, and, and direct the, con the conversation. Um, so if you have questions or you have comments, we go along. We'll be happy to take them as the panel goes. So, so, so on that note, at an appropriate time later, I think we do need to discuss the deep fake of AI. Okay. I will remember how it's not really AI. Oh yeah, yeah. Really, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. full yeah. agreement. <laughs> that damn stuff is not. Oh, that stuff is not what I've been designing. Gosh darn it. Yeah. So. Also, 
not that intelligent. <laughs> it's also not that intelligent. Very artificial, though. Yeah. But so uh, I guess just to kick us off, Andrew Meredith, why don't you tell us some of the things about the policy that is, you know, policies that are being discussed or, or yeah. bandied about or considered or? Um, so one constant about uh, DC and Congress and the government generally is you can always trust on it to uh, attempt to legislate to a crisis. Um, <laughs> and, oh, this may be a shock. Um, and AI has pretty legitimately been more or less the top of everybody's mind since I'd say spring of last year. Um, it intersects with a lot of different things. Um, the reason it came across my plate and the reason you see a lot of intellectual property lawyers talking about this is frankly because AI, so AI is a, it's a big term, arguably a meaningless <coughs> term past a certain point. Um, AI does a lot of things. Um, when we talk about deep fakes, we're generally talking about something called generative AI, um, which is where it creates like distinct outputs, and usually when we're talking about deepfakes, we're talking about audio, video, and visual um, are the big three. Um, and you all may remember last spring, um, there was a song that was purported to be a Drake song that came out, and it turns out, well, Drake claims it wasn't him. I am kind of a truther about this. I think he actually may have been involved. Um, and this blew up all over the place. Um, and that was when I got the call where a reporter, this is just quick backstory. Um, I had talked to a reporter back in like 2018 or so, it just a, it was a friend of mine talking about, um, she had questions about like, well, what happens if AI finally hits us? Uh, and I was like, eh, I don't know. So we just sort of spitballed for a minute. And I made a joke about training an AI just on Beyonce songs. <laughs> and this made it into the write-up on The Verge. Um, and I forgot about it until, you know, all of a sudden, spring 2023, I got a, an email from a new reporter at The Verge saying, hey, you sound like you know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> jokes on them. Uh, I had to learn what I was talking about pretty quickly. Um, and so because it has often come up in the concept of the entertainment industries, um, has been like the really high profile use in a lot of cases, that's the frame that people have been thinking about it through. So we've seen a lot of movement around things like um, what's called rights of publicity, um, which is the right to control the use of your likeness. Um, we've seen uh, attempts to, um, you know, the fights about copyrights, the copyrighted material being used as training data for these machines. Um, you know, it's really all over the place. I mean, we have, for better or for worse, AI has kind of like worked its way into every policy area and everyone has to have a take um, on how it goes, and so it's sort of inescapable. But when we're talking about deep fakes, just like keep in mind, we're typically talking, we're not talking about AI used for things like uh, medical imaging recognition. Um, on this panel specifically, we're mostly talking about things like audio and visual and video outputs. Right, and uh, great point about the entertainment side of it. So in addition, I serve on an organization here called the Georgia Screen Entertainment Coalition, which is a private side uh, representing the entertainment industry. So it's Disney, it's Sony, it's the Georgia Game Developers Association, kind of the mouse in the giant elephants. And hearing them talk about AI, it's very clear that they haven't figured out where they want to go with it yet either. So all these discussions about how AI is going to lay everyone off, or AI is going to be used by them to hire more people to do more things, they don't know yet. They don't know where they want the regulations to go, and they're still trying to figure out. You'll hear them in these conversations going back and forth because they don't know yet. So part of the reason Georgia has been looked at as a model is we've actually already had three bills introduced here, which uh, started here but have gotten a lot of national attention and have gotten spread around various groups looking to see how they can regulate AI. And one of the fascinating bits of this is it's not a Republicans versus Democrats issue. We are seeing Republicans versus Republicans and Democrats versus Democrats and coalitions of Republicans and Democrats together, both for and against these bills. So we had three bills get introduced in the last session. How many folks are from Georgia here? Oh, wow, excellent, one or two of you, beautiful. So if you don't know this, in Georgia, we have a two-year session. In other words, a bill can be introduced in one year and can be passed the next year. If it doesn't pass that second year of the session, then it's dead, you've got to start all over again. So this was just uh, the second year of the session. So we had three bills that did not make it all the way through. Two of them did pass out of the House, they did not pass the Senate. One met, made out of the Senate, did not pass the House. So there's been a little bit of this House versus Senate stuff going on, even though both are controlled by the Republican Party here in Georgia. So 
we had three, and they show three of the main areas where people are concerned about deep fakes. So House Bill 986, and you can look these up online to read the, the uh, text of them, they're very interesting. 986 was the political one. And it would actually make a felony if you intentionally create a deep fake to misrepresent people on political issues and specifically on candidates. If you wanted to misrepresent a candidate, their, their, space, their stances, etc. cetera. Uh, so that did pass out of the House, good bipartisan coalition on that, made it through. Got to the Senate, the Senate was, well, wait a minute, this is going a bit too broad. They put in their own replacement bill. They did not go anywhere. No one could agree on what they wanted it to do. And then, of course, I always think that Scott is kind of a harbinger with the EFF track. So he sent us this track, what, three months ago? Why don't we do one of deepfakes? And, of course, what is it, two weeks ago, we see the Donald Trump, Taylor Swift <laughs> deepfake suddenly making this the news. Scott is always ahead of himself on this. Things he presents, you know, I know it's going to be interested in that, bam. A news event will suddenly happen. I think he actually and makes the, the Trump news. Harris one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. So suddenly this is the news. All right. House Bill 993 was in reaction to something that actually happened in Cobb County at the high school, where somebody made deep fakes of girls at the high school, which were extremely inappropriate. But our laws uh, regulating pornography like did not cover that specifically. It could not actually prosecute that anywhere near what they wanted to. So it was a bill to make that a felony here in Georgia with some pretty serious ramifications as well. That also cleared the House, did not make it out of uh, Senate. And Senate Bill 78 was regarding adults creating uh, sexual content, defake sexual uh, content of adults to harass them. So we've seen these three areas come across. None of them have passed yet. So in Georgia, we've had some special committee hearings on AI, both from the Senate and the House that run their own. And it's been very interesting seeing the conversations back and forth. Because here it's not Republican versus Democrat, it is House versus Senate as to what's going to pass and what we're going to agree to in the end. So expect this to come up. Our legislative session starts in January. Expect to see new bills introduced then, modeled off of what we've already had. And I think you'll be seeing these in more and more states around the country, very similar to what we're doing in Georgia. The technology for low quality fakes. The technology for low quality fakes has been around since ninety one. That's we've been doing it in games forever. Sure. So, um, how does the le the you know, legislation address that? And uh, and so the district attorney was not able to create with the existing. Uh, um, um, Legislation? Right, and that is a uh, very specific definitions within them. Part of the argument between them is what classifies as AI. And the definitions in the House bills are very much generative AI. Mm -hmm. They're very much focused on generative AI, using generative AI tools. Not just artificial images. That's right. It's focused on the That's generative right. AI. Well, I think one of the real issues with this area is I mean, the two areas, especially that Andrew mentioned that, that George is looking at, politics and adult content, non-consensual adult content, I'm trying to be very tactful since I'm looking at a child. <laughs> but the, the, um, the, the, good there. <laughs> the, the problem with that is there are laws, but the laws don't address it in many ways because we don't have any type of uniformity. Um, one of the things that is a policy thing that's been coming around is the USPTO just had a public uh, round table to see if the public had any comment on whether there should be a federal right of privacy, right of publicity style law, because what what would govern someone's use of your image, whether you're a celebrity or you're not a celebrity or you're just, you know, regular guy on the street, is whatever right of publicity or right of privacy law would apply to you, probably defined by what state you live in. But each state has their own, and some like California or New York, who have lots of famous people, can be very protective. Some, like Georgia, where we have Martin Luther King, or Tennessee, where we have Elvis, can be very, very protective and exist past death and, and have other benefits. Some states don't have anything at all because they don't really think about it. So some of these things may be more or less protective depending on where you live. And when it comes to issues like revenge porn or non-consensual non pornography, I'm taking your image. Many states, most states have passed some kind of revenge porn bill now, but almost all of them have language in it that talks about specifically me sharing an image of you against your, you know, a, 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 an actual image of you against your consent. Well, 
that doesn't cover a manufactured deep fake image of you. Right. And so, so I, that's why we're trying to cover I, some I, of these I use it. If a person's not actually involved in the making of it, right. so we've got an upskirts law, thankfully, but this is an upskirts. This is an event that didn't actually happen. So right. I will point out one New York actually does specifically have uh, an addendum for mm -hmm. generating imagery. Like right. I think they're the only ones. Yeah, um, a couple of states are trying to pass. And they're trying to pass it. So, so one thing, just to zoom out a little bit, when we talk about rights of publicity. So everybody knows, I'm not going to say everybody knows copyright, because um, that's my job is knowing copyright. I can tell you definitively not everybody knows copyright, <laughs> um, especially people who should. Um, so the thing about right of publicity is right of publicity is fundamentally anchored in this idea that your likeness has commercial value. So right to publicity are designed for situations where you are um, a celebrity. So say TJ uh, became famous overnight and wants to license his image out to, uh, you know, to Dragon Con for marketing. Um, now, normally, if your likeness has commercial value, TJ could turn around and be like, okay, so you owe me money. Like, I'm going to charge you money for the right to use my likeness. Rights of publicity exist so that if Dragon Con went out and used his image anyway, TJ would have a cause of action to be like, hey, normally you'd have to pay me for this, but you didn't. And so give me, give me my money back. Um, but fundamentally, rights of publicity are rooted in the idea that your look, your face, has commercial value. Um, so it doesn't apply to everybody. I probably don't have a right of publicity, my decade of Dragon Con appearances notwithstanding. Um, people may have a right of publicity in certain things, but not others. Um, you know, if you're a singer, you may have a, a recognizable voice. That might be what's valuable to you, but maybe nobody knows what you look like. So think about like Sia in the era when her face was covered all the time. Um, Chuck Tingle, he's got, you know, he can argue he's got a right of publicity in his, I mean, you could talk about, get down the rabbit hole of style, but he literally travels around with a bag over his head. Um, and so these are all very patchwork and they're really designed to deal with situations where somebody is trying to use something that will make the average person go, aha, that's Elvis's voice and get an instant connection out of it. Um, it is not, they're not designed to cover a person on the street. And so when you have this attempt to address um, deep fakes, you've got all these different competing concerns, right? You've got concerns about child safety online. You've got concerns about non-consensual intimate imagery. You've got, you've got economic concerns from actors and voice actors um, that they're gonna be run out of a job. Um, you know, you have uh, concerns from models that they're gonna be run out of a job. And so you have all these different competing sort of concerns, some of which are economic concerns about like your job being displaced, that are being addressed or an attempt to address them in the same legislative framework as things like non-consensual intimate imagery or um, you know, child safety or, or things like disinformation. Um, you know, when you talk about election deep fakes, the real risk, it's an informational risk. It's a risk that something like that um, you know, it gets out into the public and it sort of poisons perceptions and poisons discourse. It's a classic misinfo problem. Um, and one other thing to think about in the context of misinformation, so this is, this is your freebie law lesson for the day. Um, back in the day, uh, there, was this, there was a magazine called Hustler Magazine. Um, has anybody seen The People vs. Larry Flint? Show of hands. Okay, good, good number. Um, so, Back in the day, you had, uh, you had Hustler Magazine, which was run by a guy named Larry Flint, who was a big provocateur. Uh, and you also had uh, Jerry Falwell. You know, Jerry Falwell was this like very, if you don't know who he is, a uh, very famous like traditional family values kind of minister. Um, very high profile sort of proto mega church kind of situation. Um, at one point, Hustler ran uh, a fake advertisement. Now, it was an advertisement for a kind of liquor. I don't remember what the brand was, but the brand, the brand itself, the actual advertisements from the real, the real advertisements from the real brand would interview celebrities about their first time, sexually. Um, they ran a fake version of this ad in Hustler Magazine purporting to interview Jerry Falwell about his first time. Uh, and the content of it was basically, it was first time was in an outhouse with his mother. Um, and this led to a huge First Amendment lawsuit that made its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. And essentially, the Supreme Court said, okay, look, first off, anybody who's reading this in Hustler magazine 
knows that this is not a real ad. Like, all the context around this, in addition to the content itself being absurd, is going to tip off people that this is a parody. And when you're a public figure, you sign up to some degree to be parodied. Like, the ability to poke fun at famous and important people is, like, really one of the bedrocks of American law. Um, and so now we have this thought exercise where you've got this case which says, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's called a public figure uh, limitations. So you have to, it has to do with defamation. But basically the, the content is, if you're a public figure, you have less protection against being defamed, especially in cases like parody. Um, and now you have a situation where we have deep fakes. So now imagine that there was a fake interview with, pick your poison, I don't know, J.D. Vance. Um, just, to, just to pull a name out of thin air, um, where something like that happened, and it was done in a deep fake video context. If it runs on the Onion's website, and it's got an Onion little Chiron on the bottom, okay, you can, you can see that, you know, and he's got lower First Amendment protections about, around being defamed because he is actively putting himself in the spotlight running for vice president. Um, and then the video escapes containment. Then what? Um, nobody has any really good answers to these yet. Uh, and we're, it's a thought experiment for now, but probably not for a whole lot longer. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the kind of like very fundamental walls that we're running into in these discussions about, you know, acknowledging the information risk, acknowledging the risk to privacy that these things pose, and like the very real harm that they can do. How do we craft policies that protect against that without fundamentally gutting the frankly cherished American right to make fun of famous and important people? Um, using the technology that is available to us. And if you've got an answer, please come up and tell me uh, afterwards because um, I would like to be a very rich person by finding the answer to this. <laughs> Quick bit of trivia. Who knows where uh, Larry Flint was shot? Lawrenceville, City Hall, Lawrenceville, Georgia. Really? About 20 miles, 15, 10, 10 miles from here. Yes. So uh, that's what put him in the wheelchair. So. Uh, Fascinating, but true. Right down the road, you can go there. It's a very much more scale, great restaurant right now. Uh, but I loved you brought up jumping way back. I loved you brought up the idea of the monetization of it because we've been dealing with this game and games for a while. There've been some big lawsuits where games have kind of set the uh, path to this, not with AI generated, but the idea of your uh, your expectations of making money off your likeness. Madden had to pay out to college athletes who they were using, uh, football players who they were using without paying for the rights. And there was a very big uh, suit with the Church of England, I'm trying to remember the game, against one of the shooters, where they modeled a church in England, and they said, no, we don't want that in the game, and there's, we're, we're suing you, we've got rights to that image. So AI generated or not, it's very important for any game uh, developers in the room? So yes, for, for Jeff over there. Um, <laughs> Uh, just a warning, when you're including places, you have to be careful whether you're AI generating it or not. So, little tangents there. Well, it really does, I mean, it's not just games through, right? I mean, that's the whole, we had young Luke Skywalker, we had Carrie Fisher come back from the dead. Yep. That was one of the big issues of the, of the strike was how much can you continue to use my image without paying me for it or, or, or once I'm gone, paying my estate for it, et cetera. So, so that's, that, that's the big problem. So that's the domestic elements. Uh, there's a huge impact for particularly uh, state and non-state actors out there. Uh, back in 2011, when uh, Israel and Lebanese Hezbollah were fighting, um, there were these doctored images about the number of missiles fired and what's targets. And you can roll that forward to recent events in which, like, what the heck is actually going on? And there's a real question. About the, but the, um, the use of altered images has been going on uh, for uh, the information and economic element of uh, whole of government, the whole of society warfare uh, for a long time. And, you know, organizations like the IRA, Lebanese Hezbollah, I can go down like a whole list of non-state actors that use these imageries in order to uh, stoke up their followers in order to bring in more money so they can more mayhem. Um, so, and, and it's getting harder, right? Because as the, as the deep fake technology, which is rather ubiquitous now, right? Any of you go to any, just about any website, you see at the bottom there, you know, that most dangerous snake in Virginia, you know, <laughs> multicolored or whatever, or, or 
ancient people that actually survived to the photograph. You know, see this giant <laughs> among people, right? And and those are websites designed that you click on them, then they take you to places you probably don't want to go, uh, particularly for your cook, your cookie jar, etc. Um, you know, they're they're there to provoke you, provoke a, uh, actions. But there are um, some serious uh, uh, geopolitical consequences uh, of this, and it really. You know, we saw this uh, more than 10 years ago. Real questions about when and what can you trust when you see things on the television or you see things on the computer, uh, et cetera. You know, what can you really trust in the imagery? And we've already seen newspapers and other things get caught and go, oops, I uh, shouldn't have let that up. But, you know, like you said, it, it, it gets out in the wild because, you know, New York Times or someone else picks it up and, and rolls with the story. <laughs> and the contractions two days later, you know, on the small paragraph at the bottom. So, but it really begs the question of what is truth in this kind of arm? I feel like Pontius Pilate. <laughs> what is truth? Well, the, the classic deep fake provocation, not AI, is Hitler <laughs> saying that the Poles attacked Germany in 1939 and showing photos of the damage of the alleged Polish attack, which was all doctored, set up by, uh, by German soldiers to give them a, an excuse to invade. Um, to make Poland. We haven't seen AI provocations on that level yet, but there's no reason to think we won't. And uh, so when we talk, right now when we talk about politics and deep fakes, we are talking about the Taylor Swift pictures. The Harris. Yeah, and I think we're talking about a question of scope and speed um, and the, the ease with which, we, which, which this, this is now available to just people. Um, so I mean, like, famously, Stalin erased his rifle set of photos. Um, I actually, one of my colleagues was playing around with the baked in uh, iPhoto app to see if he could take that same photo and erase the guy even better. Um, answer, no, Stalin did it better. Actually. Um, so a lot of this is not a new problem. And that's the other part of this debate is there are some of these problems, there are laws but, but baked that, in to deal with. The means has been democratized. The means yeah. has been democratized. And so that raises a question. A lot of folks <coughs> have the response of, well, then we need to control the means. We need to go after the technology. We need to regulate the technology itself. Yeah. And that's a whole separate can of worms. Um, because the technology exists. This is a genie that you cannot put that back in the bottle once it exists. Um, and so the question becomes, well, how do you, you know, Photoshop is a technology that lets you erase Stalin's buddies out of photos. Um, and now you can do it on your iPhone. A lot of these technologies are useful for accessibility purposes. Um, you know, if you, uh, if anybody here uses Blue Sky, Mm -hmm. um, they have an alt text feature now where if it recognizes text in the image, you can just hit a button and it'll copy all the alt text in there. Um, a lot of their GIFs come preloaded with descriptions now. You know, these are, these are technologies that exist and are useful. And so the question is, is there a way to sort of, in, in, and again, as somebody who works in DC, I tend to think in terms of legislative language, is there a way to define out the, the versions of this that are only used for bad things. So, you know, is there a way to uh, to save your iPhone's accessibility features, things like their voice cloning technology, which exists on, I think is, I think is bog standard now on iPhones, um, while simultaneously taking down maketaylorswiftporn.com. <laughs> Um, and how do you do that? And again, if you have the answer, please tell me. Um, I've as many I, hours of my life. I'm wondering I would explore is the data. The AI can't do anything without data. So if someone actually controls and owns the data and takes efforts to safeguard it, um, you can't train the AI to, to do that, or at least not very well. But that's the real question, right? I mean, it's the speed and access that is a concern for yes, me. Right. Because there's, there's software right now that we could all go download right now that will make essentially a face filter of, of deep fake imagery. And I can, pay, I can take any celebrity. It's got as many images as you need of any celebrity or any politician. Which, you know, when you're, when you're faking a photograph or you're making a fake video, it can be very believable. It can be very concerning. But if you have the technology to just put someone's face on and, and, and mislead people live, it's much more believable when you're live. And look, this is not, I mean, the, the, the stuff that's available to all of us right now, we can go download immediately, is, it's just a filter. If you don't 
if it doesn't matter if you put Taylor Taylor Swift's face on me, no one's gonna believe that it's Taylor Swift with you know the rest of, the rest Taylor, of Taylor me. Taylor Swift had a rough weekend. And no hair, <laughs> dragon. This voice, but 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 at the end of the day, that's just because that's one free technology that's out there and available. The fact that that is going to get better and going to get more believable, and we're talking about the concerns of like a geopolitical aspect or a political aspect, celebrity aspect. Training the data, the data is there. I can I can train on President Biden by going and finding all of the news of President Biden for the last four years. But I think they hit on one of the key issues, which is the democratization of these tools. The game teams I've been able to work with have been able to make deep fakes of this quality since the mid to late 90s. Mm -hmm. Now, however, anybody can do it. And that's, I think, where we're getting a lot of the fear now from folks mm -hmm. in, in higher levels who do pass the legislation we see. Uh, in Brazil right now, the discussion to ban Twitter is partially around, I'm trying to name Twitter gangs that they talk about who try to keep the former president in power with a lot of deep fake false information. Uh, and it is the idea that it wasn't just that president and his cronies and his highly paid folks doing it, it were just these people from who knows where uh, creating stuff that they could not stamp out to win wildfire and help cause all sorts of trouble in Brazil. So, so that's the kernel of the next real danger is if you have a society that does not trust the information coming to them and they turn to a savior to save them and can label uh, things that they don't like disinformation I mean you know, a libertarian in me says hey if someone says something you don't like the response is more conversation more dialectic right but you have this moment this movement uh, that I think is very dangerous of people out there who say, no, we need to say this person knows the truth. They control the truth. Um, and that, of course, is, you know, death of democracy right there. Uh, and death of government, because now you don't have a mechanism to tell someone when they're wrong. So, um, but that is a real danger of this man on the white horse, the digital white horse uh, uh, coming in, uh, saying, I know what is truth and I shall tell you what it is. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, in the current in, in climate, um, people in power are kind of moving in that direction. So I, I, I'm very, very concerned uh, about the, the backlash where this, where this takes us. It was fascinating seeing these fears coming from law enforcement when you started seeing the photos of Donald Trump attempted assassination with the Secret Service agent smiling, which were deep fake created. And suddenly law enforcement is saying, wait a minute, this is going to get folks shooting at us. And suddenly you had a new group calling for regulations around deep fakes. And that's outside of what the Georgia bills would have already done, which would have been to discredit some individual like this, is to put them at risk. And now how do you incorporate that into this sort of legislation? So Maybe we have a ministry. Ministry. <laughs> <laughs> what year are we in? Um, <laughs> so one thing that I think we, ha we haven't really touched on yet is that we're all talking about this sort of spread, and presumably through the internet. Like I'm not printing this out and handing it, like mailing it on a stamp to my dad in South Carolina. But people print memes and put them on the office fridge all the time. That is true. <laughs> Could be the same, um, right? And so there's kind of two, there's two questions here. One is like, how do you ultimately attach some legal penalties fundamentally to creation or distro or whatever, some act involving this? The other problem though is just attaching penalties to that doesn't get it offline. Um, the spread continues unchecked. I don't know if anybody here has ever been involved in a lawsuit. They take a long time. Um, and so there's this running question of, well, if there's really these information risks, um, or if there is, you know, stuff that is very imminently harmful to an individual, things like non-consensual intimate imagery, child harm images, how do you get those removed from the ecosystem as fast as possible? This is sort of a parallel conversation that's happening right now among a lot of policymakers. Um, the obvious... God help me. The most obvious analog is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, and I say this, and it is, it is a deeply imperfect, uh, but arguably decent enough solution to a terrible problem, because all of the other alternatives are worse. Um, but the problem is... You're saying this is our least bad option? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, I hate being pragmatist sometimes. Um, so the upshot is, okay, so, so there's lots of problems with the DMCA, which I will talk about for hours if you let me. Um, but the question is, you know, fundamentally, the DMCA is a model where any individual 
and I mean any individual, um, because there's, it's several steps removed to any kind of deterrent value for lying about this, can send a notice and yoink something off the internet um, unilaterally. And if there's any consequences for lying about it, they are so far down the line and like as a functional matter, they've been rendered dead letter by the courts. Um, and so that in and of itself is a huge misinformation risk because if you have some kind of similar situation where you know, say there's a deep fake or there's some non-consensual intimate imagery. I think there's kind of less of an information risk when you're dealing with explicit images. But say there's something online, um, there's videos of uh, a police brutality that are posted online and they go viral on Twitter. And somebody comes up and says, that's not me, that's a deep fake beating that man in the head with a baton. Yoink! And then it's gone. Um, or you have certain former government officials coming out and saying, I don't look that terrible when I'm speaking at the border wall. That's a deep fake yoink, and you take it down. And then what? You know, you now have given it, private individuals the ability to unilaterally disappear something from the internet, which is an incredibly powerful tool. So how do you balance the checks on that? Um, do you have a mandatory putback provision? Because that can be great, uh, you know, for fighting disinformation in like high profile cases of like politicians or, you know, things of national interest. Might not be as useful if you've got private uh, images of somebody that, you know, really should have been taken down in the first place. And so again, intractable questions, come see me with answers. Yeah, so so the, now the question is, is the rate of, do you use your phrase, yoinking it off the... It's highly path, scientific <laughs> phrase of, uh, uh, of removing it from the internet and it being reposted Right under all the different channels that are that are, are, are available, what's that? What's that competition look like? Right. Well, that's been one of the challenges. You, you can go ahead and come up with the mic if you want. Well, uh, well, the, the, go ahead. No, good. Oh, um, so uh, the libertarian position is often, well, let's just have more people out there giving the correct information. Let's let this be a battle of ideas. But one of the interesting things I've seen, how many people here live in Gwinnett? I saw there are a lot of Georgians here. Gwinnett Library is an awesome institution. They've got a great <coughs> video on identifying fake photos and the like, and they talk about the resources to go to to identify them. And they bring up things like Snopes. Unfortunately, of late, I've been seeing fake Snopes yeah. images generated in order to discredit Snopes as a fact-checking website. So it's fascinating to see, do we have legal protections for this? Not really. So now we got to go to the marketplace of ideas to win it, and suddenly some of our best um, sources in the marketplace of ideas are being discredited using these AI-generated deep fakes. So at what point do we actually... So, so, so turtles all the way down. Mm -hmm. yeah, but at some point, the consumer has to start... But it has go, to be informed. Go, uh, yes, the uh, consumer has to inform themselves and say, I don't believe hey, nothing. where does this come from? <laughs> or, yeah, or I don't believe a damn thing. <laughs> And, you know, once one organization gets caught with their hand in the cookie jar, right, should you really believe them again? Yeah. yeah. You should write science fiction. <laughs> I try. Question. Um, what, um, I just want to make sure what I'm hearing and because... And it's not real, it's all fake. I was worried before, but my That's worry right. meter has now really... <laughs> Woohoo! My <laughs> <retired. Yeah. laughs> It's fine. Everything's fine. We have free Xanax. Yeah. <laughs> There's very little. Just tell, tell me, you know, correct me. There's very little civil legislation for deep fakes, and there's no criminal laws on the books. Not true. Sure. Not on not the books. True. No legislation aplenty exists. Yeah. So there's a lot of attempts to deal with this from a lot of different angles. But no um, law exists. Well, well right. So so, so there are currently name, image, and likeness laws, rights of publicity, rights of right. privacy that exist. The challenge in trying to enforce those against you know broad action is that they're so everything is very state specific. So if you're in this state and I'm in this state, we don't have the same rights. And that's one of the that's one of the challenges. So some litigation, some legislation exists in some places that will apply to some of these acts. So if I Sometimes. create a deep fake that harms you financially, you can come sue me for it. And if I've done it maliciously to physically harm you somehow, mm. there there are old statutes that can be applied, but they are not as universally applicable as we'd like them to be. Yeah. And then there are arguments of even do these always apply in all situations? Any criminal? 
Well, some of the some of those statutes would be criminal, not necessarily. I mean, again, so some of the many of the state revenge porns are criminal. The the revenge porn statutes are criminal. Some of those state revenge porns. Statutes, revenge porns. I don't know what that's just coming from. <laughs> some of those state, some of those state revenge porn statutes have been broadened to include digital manipulated imagery, but not all of them have. And you know, well, most states have. Not all states do have any revenge porn laws either. So you're back to your basic tort actions and seeing what happens. So if you came to me and said I have a problem could I try to figure out something to throw at it I could would it be ideal eh. yeah there's more Depends than there were this are. time last year that's for sure oh um, sure yeah I mean Tennessee passed one I literally it's called the Elvis Act mm -hmm. they, they back to yeah. that one um, but can I sell the Elvis estate without them knowing it yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so I mean they do exist and they're popping up left and right um, of varying degrees of specificity some of them are very targeted towards things like non-consensual intimate imagery um, some of them are much more general, some of them have really long terms, like life plus 70 years, uh, so 70 years after the death of the person involved, they got that one from copyright. Um, some of them are much shorter, some of them only apply for living people, so it's really, it is a patchwork right now, and that's, you know, I think a lot of folks are rightly very concerned about that. And just to be clear, life plus 70 years isn't the term in jail, it's how long you've rights to <laughs> Um, quick question, so we've been talking about legal elements where mentioned with lawsuits that may be not specific to um, a deep fake itself but the fact that the damage that this falsehood causes mm -hmm. so with the deep fake is it actually viable or slander because it's not really verbal it's not literal it's being it's that, that's kind of thinking about that so, it's right. yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so i mean it's in theory if it's any type of def but yeah, where would you put it? Because it is a defamation. So if it's defamation, we already have many laws about what you can do defamation-wise. But so in some of the, we should talk about famous people and yeah, et, right. et cetera. So do we even need to go down the whole rabbit hole of, deep, of, of additional deep fake? Well, because there's things that aren't necessarily defamatory, defamatory that would still be yeah, yeah, misinformation sure, sure. or potentially right. harmful to a person or to society. Yeah. Well, is putting them in a compromising position is that? automatically depends on how compromising and how yeah. legal okay. and what it would be so sometimes a compromising situation would be defamation per se to be the easiest thing in the world to prove sometimes it just wouldn't even rise to the level of defamation at all depends on what and who yeah so a political candidate having one of the presidential presidential candidates say i support mandatory abortions for everybody right now i mean is that libel is that slander but could definitely hurt their political chances so that's what uh house bill 986 was more focused on rather specific monetary arms go ahead and just come on up to the mic well, I'm all the way oh how are you oh, well, uh, yeah it's it's the right to be forgotten. what about the right to be forgotten or be with that? well so does any of this dovetail with the right to be forgotten just recording that for you guys okay. what is the right to be forgotten california yeah, it's only in California. That's the next panel. <laughs> right. So, 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 um, it's it's taking off of a European statute, but it's it's basically a, a, a and I'm a Georgia lawyer, so I I've been to California once, so uh, take this with a shaker of salt. But it is it, it is a a mechanism by which you can elect to have your data stripped from the internet or from certain places on the internet have have not have your your information be so easily and publicly found um again i don't know all of the specifics about it at all it it, it would it would potentially impact the, that to the extent that that i created fake information about you and put it on the internet instead but i don't know that that would necessarily dovetail directly into this specific issue i think the thing that where you would have heard the 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 discussions of policy and legislation that will most impact this is if any of you are college sports fans because the NCAA name image and likeness issue that was a couple of years ago um, had all these exact same conversations about how do we how do we protect people's license likenesses how do we allow people to monetize them how do we allow athletes to do it with the school each school each school put their own rules in and had a patchwork of, of, of mechanisms for athletes to to monetize their 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 name or their likeness, so 
it, 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 that's the thing that most closely ties to the current policy discussions here, but I'm sure there's some overlap. Yeah, I just don't know it all. I, so I am not a privacy lawyer. Um, a good friend of mine is, and I, I picked her brain about this more generally, not specifically in the right to be forgotten context, but privacy, again, people, people when they hear about deep fakes, first they think, oh, clearly this copyright solution. Um, and usually the second thought is, well, clearly this is a privacy issue. The problem with privacy law is privacy law is designed to protect actual facts about you. Um, and definitionally, a deep fake is not an actual, this is not an actual thing that you have done. So you don't have a privacy right in something you never did, basically, is the um, sort of internal conundrum. But alternatively, the data used to create the deep fake came from your data set. Yes. Um, and the amount of data that the internet service providers and others have on you is vast. I mean, they're like counting the seconds in which your mouse hangs over an image on a particular website, et cetera. It's vast. And so it's actually more expensive for them to delete all that information than it is uh, um, for, you know, it's, <coughs> because memory is so cheap. It's actually cheaper for them to keep and maintain it uh, because they're selling it. You're the product, right? Um, and it would actually be extremely expensive to them to have to delete all of that because it's it's vast and uh, and it's also essentially a giant hash table um, coding the other, thing. So the other thing to keep to go in find it is when and I <coughs> promise I promise we will let you ask your questions. Um, data deletion in an already trained model is a huge problem. Again, uh, we're just listing all kinds of problems no one has solved. Yeah. Um, this <laughs> is one of them. Right. Um, Data leaves a shadow, even if you do delete it without completely wrecking the model, it can still infer the same things it was doing before, even after you've taken it out. So, like, the idea of data deletion is kind of, I think, uh, calling it untested is generous. <laughs> Sisyphusian task? <laughs> yeah. So, I know that um, the law is not exactly uh, very quick to act, um, but, um, you know, thinking about all these things that you've brought up, and uh, that they're not solely because they're not solely AI problems. They're multiple problems, including social media loopholes that are used by threat actors. Um, you know, things like that. The fact that there are cameras everywhere now. Um, so, at what point are we chasing our tails by trying to legislate AI and not looking at the larger problem, which? has yet to be defined. Because <laughs> it's technolo yeah. te the technology du jour, right? AI is the technology du jour, so it's being blamed, but it's not really what's to blame. Dude, we can have a jihad. Destroy AI. <laughs> I that card yeah. game. Call, call, call my friend Butler. Yeah. So, I would go back to what they said. The issue isn't necessarily that this technology exists, it's that it's in everybody's hands right. now. Because right. the technology has existed for a long time. The idea that it's no longer in a controllable area I mean, law enforcement feels yeah. they're at risk, high-level politicians yeah. feel they're at risk, entertainers feel they're at risk, your teachers at school oh. feel they're at risk, Speed. underage girls in Cobb County no, feel they're at risk. We're suddenly, you know, I mean, the, 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 any kid can make nasty stuff about their friends in school, suddenly becomes a concern in every school. So it's, become, it's a question of speed, ubiquity, mm -hmm. uh, and sophistication, those three heads of the hydra and we chop one off two more ago. Right. And I mean, that's really the reality, right? We, we, we talk, I, I talked about this for years. Uh, the, the fact that technology moves much faster than the law. And I mean, we're, we're still dealing with the Copyright Act of 1976. <laughs> <laughs> you know what didn't exist or be contemplated? We, we, were, we had to worry about tape recording because we hadn't caught up to that yet with the law. That's why that's still only case law. So solve it, the phonograph. Yeah, <laughs> player it, pianos are. It, <laughs> it, 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 it is it is always a challenge to try to have any type of technology law because by the time you pass a law, that technology has evolved and changed and isn't what we're talking about anymore. I just wanted to get back to the porn thing again. Of course, um, as we all do. <laughs> uh, the article this week about the U.S. Army soldier up in Alaska that was using AI chat box to create kitty porn from uh, some kids that he knew. And it said that the Department of Justice was going after him. So the FBI and the Department of Justice is doing something. Yes. I don't know what, what statutes they're going after for because there's not a federal. Wait, 
there is yeah. Yeah, well actually there's some very there are some very harsh federal laws about the data he used That's right, to create using all their that. stuff. I, right. I, you know, uh, uh, That's unfortunately, true. I know people who have been thrown in jail, federal jail, for essentially lifetime for possessing that information. And so this computer. person uh, um, had this data, which he would use to train his AI, just having the data in the first place. It is, it is also the official position of prosecutors that it's CSAM, which is Child Sexual Abuse Material, the acronym. So if you hear CSAM, that's what it means. Um, that this includes simulated CSAM. So things that are not actual photographic. Um, so uh, drawings, like entire genres of anime, um, are considered legally, under the position of the Department of Justice, those count as CSAM and they are prosecutable. So I would not be shocked if they're extending that rationale. Yeah. Um, so I, I suspect that there's three, uh, three ways in which uh, the law is going to have a really tough time dealing with these issues, and I'd be interested to know if I'm wrong on any of these. The first would be in actually trying to find the person who created such materials, because often that might be vague, somebody could do it anonymously. Uh, the second could, uh, likely would be actually verifying the truth of certain generated materials I suspect if the technology gets better, that's going to become nearly impossible. Did you actually give a speech saying that in front of a private group of donors or not? And then the third part probably would be actually finding all the places on the internet where something is, because there's a lot of us who are kind of information pack rats who have relatively less uh, public, not search uh, indexed places where we just don't want any information to disappear, fake or not, and we'll copy stuff around, and probably people won't be able to find it. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'd be curious to know if on any of these fronts I'm wrong and you think law could actually deal with these issues. Well, let me let, let me address the last one first because it was actually the point I started to make earlier and then got sidetracked. I have ADHD. So the, the, uh, the problem with technology is that any legal solution is a game of whack-a-mole. I can try to take it down from that side. I can yoink it from your site, but then he has it and he has it and she has it, and I've got to go follow all my DMCA procedures to yoink, 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 and then it's back over here again. So it is, it is always a challenge to try and find all of the places on the internet something has spread. But the, per but the purpose of law isn't necessarily to get rid of it, it's to punish the offender. Cor correct. So I would say that's actually the least of the three thing might exist, but you want that person in jail, you want monetary compensation. And Which as they go to find it, to deter people from doing it in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Get, getting the imagery. Yeah. And it often depends on how many how much resources the government is willing to devote to tracking down this one instance. I mean, we have this uh, this uh, the two folks from overseas who just got busted on swatting, Obviously, a lot of resources went into finding these two people because they've been swatting uh, people in Congress and uh, yeah. the Georgia House and so forth. So identifying people online is more a matter of the resources we're willing to commit than whether it's doable or not. Yeah, and, and provenance questions about like who created an image, where does it come from, where did it get downloaded from, are, are a combination of law and technical questions, um, and they are like at the they're one of the top sets of questions that like some of these um, like. PCAST, which I don't ask me what the acronym stands for, but it's basically a sort of presidential level task force that is thinking about this. Those are some of the big questions they're trying to work through. So given the uh, conversations going on in here, do you guys see any way in the near future as more people become aware of the capabilities of these democratized tools that most people refuse to believe things that weren't their own lived experiences? Because like, and I didn't hear any conversation about it, but like NVIDIA made a tool that you could take 30 second clip of somebody's voice into voice synthesis, and you run a couple things through a filter, and you could have a TikTok grade video that would be indistinguishable just because, you know, low quality 420 pixel filter, congrats, you can't tell that it was generated, right? So as soon as the general public understands the pr how prolific and easy these tools are to use, like, people already don't want to believe things that go against their own bias. You add this to the mix. In the How end, do we not end there? In the end, it was up to the consumer to control these things. You actually brought up a great point. I was actually going to angle towards that as well. So you guys have talked about some, you know, very serious issues, obviously, with these technologies. But I wanted to ask about another issue related to 
what was just asked. Uh, right now, you know, fraud is everywhere, right? Like it, last year, I got a message on Facebook from someone reporting to my grandma saying, hey, I have a great way to make lots of money. And I was like, oh no, grandma got scammed. It's like, no, it was, I called my mother-in-law and she's like, no, that's not her account. It's a fake, that's fine. But that brings up this point, which is, at what point, you know, as audio deepfakes become prolific, do we not even be able to trust phone calls anymore? Like right now, uh, one of the go-to methods for determining if something you found is uh, a scam or a fake message on social media is, okay, I don't think my sister actually posted that video on Twitter. Let me call her and check. Right now, you know, Phone calls are a very important tool for fighting disinformation, at least at a personal level. But with audio deepfakes, we lose that as well, which, again, will accelerate into what was just mentioned. At some point, we might just not be able to use the internet for anything but entertainment. <laughs> well, in, 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 in that statement, if you can take those you know, live deepface technologies that, that replace you on a live stream video, work in a, an audio synthesizer as well, and now you've got you got your grandma giving you a video call and telling you that. Now, I think what we have to be aware of is that grandma is probably not calling me up and telling me how she won $5 million and needs to send me a check and I need to sell money off to somebody else. <laughs> so, you know, th th it, it, it's going to be, to some extent, the same thing you would do otherwise, just do I believe this, do I want to verify this. Now, calls are, are important, but unless someone kidnapped your sister and took her phone to use the, the fake, you can call your sister directly. The same way we do now, right? You get that letter from your bank that says, you need to log into your account, click here, and we say, no, I'm going to go to my bank website or I'm going to call my bank phone number that I know and say, do you need something? So you, you verify through that other, that other step. Now, that's great with things you know, it's gonna be a lot harder with general fact, but that's, that's where, it coming down to the consumer really, really means it's, it's up to us to make judgment calls and, and good choices. It is fascinating how much generative AI is being used for phishing attacks and scams. And the studies that have been coming out of this thing is a tremendous amount and a lot of money already being lost on that. But the laws already exist to deal with that. Mm. So, I mean, that's not, an, the law side isn't an issue. It is, again, people wising up and knowing not when not to touch it. And, Thanks. I don't know if all of us are 100% perfect on that. We haven't been snagged yet is uh, the main thing we say. So I've got an idea, and maybe this is a terrible idea, and I think it's So are the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> What's our least bad right? option? <laughs> so the issue seems to be normal people can't monetize their images, their voices, things like that. If we set up a law where everybody's image and voice are automatically monetized, and then you just set up the free market where you can set up a company and say, hey, if somebody's posting stuff about you, I will go and charge the Twitter, make them pay rates for using your image, and yeah, then, you know, so, so there's, yeah, there's a number the of regulatory holes in there. Yep. Uh, so let's just take the example of the uh, marijuana stores in different states. And there's the front side of the store where they're selling the licensed stuff, and there's the stuff going out the back door, right, and there's plenty of cover or what's going on there. You're gonna face a similar situation and, and the amount of data you're talking about is vast, vast. Fundamentally, that requires you to hand over all of your likeness rights to a third party and then not have a ton of control over what they do with it. Uh, the other thing is like, again, to some extent, if you, if you have a situation where everyone can f have fully and totally control every use of their likeness, there goes reporting. There goes TV news, there goes most social media, and we could debate about whether anything of value would be lost with some of these things, but at the end of the day, the ability to quote people would fall under things like this. The ability to record people, the ability to do interviews, like, you know, if you have an interview and you flub something, and then they come back and say, by the way, I revoke my right for you to use my likeness in this interview where I stuck my foot in my mouth. Um, I've had interviews where I've thought about that, <laughs> but you don't do it. Um, and you can't do it, and there's a good reason you can't do it. But to play devil's advocate, if we're looking for laws right now where people can control their own data, in other words, I own my data and the data companies can't sell it without my permission or at least have to pay me for it, could that then be a subset of those data? Did laws? you read your terms of service? <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a toss about my TOS. 
<laughs> see, if I cover right, myself in ice cubes, he can't see me. Right. <laughs> right. Right now, this is this is the problem with the camera only being on us. Everyone <laughs> <laughs> watching this video later does not get to see this fantastic costume. You <laughs> should have the helmet on too. Fire away! No pun intended. Oh. <laughs> From the voice of hell, I ask you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sorry, just a uh, frog in my throat there. <laughs> Uh, we've all had the ability for a while to digitally sign our emails with a uh, cryptographic thing that proves that that email only could have come from me. And Microsoft digitally signs all their software that says, "Okay, if it if uh, it's got this uh, uh, passes this test, then yes, it came from Microsoft and hasn't been altered since it came from Microsoft." Maybe Snopes needs to take this as the wave of the future that every image, every story a reporter puts out says this was my story. There's still the, the uh, problem that maybe that reporter didn't have a lot of ethics in the first place, but those that, that do, you know, you can check their reputation after a time. Uh, and, and of course, then there's always the human error of what if I really accidentally released that key to, to somebody else uh, as well. But that could be our wave of the future that everything Every photo that I take, I digitize and, and put some kind of signature that that was my photo there, and, and every company uh, that wants to protect themselves. But then, you know, people will still be doing the fakes, but there, you might make a fast way to find out if this really came from the or not. But there's a community that's going to push back strongly on that, and that's law enforcement. I mean, just look what happened to the pretty good privacy uh, thing uh, a decade ago. What's happened in France just recently, uh, you know, the, these encryption right you you encrypt these images to make sure it's just you and only goes to someone else well, what's in that picture right what are you sending to them so the law enforcement folks are just like hey wait a minute you now have the means to talk to someone and i can't read it the other issue with having digital watermarks to prove that this is authentic is i as an end user can't test that right? i don't have the ability to do it so it doesn't help me it helps Maybe uh, the police it helps Microsoft, but does me very little good unless we somehow democratize the tools to check these, which is certainly what you'd like to see. And there are tools out there right now to check and see is this AI generated or not, but that is such a yeah. fast battle between the two to see which is better AI, AI test whether check. this is AI. The groups that are fighting around that one right now is the most are news organizations, specifically things like Getty Images, Associated Press, like a lot of photographers are. are dealing with exactly this question of like, how do we make sure that people know this is a real photograph that we actually took? And not either A, something we didn't take that's being attributed to us, or B, something we did take that is being stripped of provenance information. So we actually need to wrap it up. We are at eight o'clock. Hey, maybe it's super quick, or you yeah, can come ask real quick. Okay. How about making the software that does the deep fakes market, water market? Well, so you know it is. Yeah, and except the bad actors who can make the software. Yeah, anyway, right. that, that, that's, that's not hard <laughs> to make. long to fake that, too. You're, well, I can, I can, yeah, range of session in your app. Yeah. Remember to rate it in your app. Thank you. I think we're all forgetting the important part, though, which is now all those videos and, and pictures of our youth, which none of them exist to me, of course, those are all deep fakes. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, if anybody, absolutely. If anybody would so like a fan fiction yeah. deep state badge ribbon. Yes. Thank you all. Kick off for EFS first session. Yay! Good job, EFF track.